happening, and we will deploy it between now and 2020 if it's commercially viable. That's very important to our debtors and very important to the certainty of bringing people back. And that's the social, the social issue there as well, about bringing people who have emigrated back into the country with those skills. Thank you. Just, um, just, just one moment, uh, just, Mr. Whelan. Just one point on the capacity issue. I have experience in the sector. The most intractable uh, group of long-term unemployment within the live register is actually males within the age group, the cohort, uh, that would have fallen out of the construction sector. And I uh, haven't seen the industry ramp up and ramp down. I think there's every expectation that, that if you had a, a pipeline uncertainty around a pipeline of house building, you would see some of that com coming back into employment, which obviously has the benefit in terms of savings on social welfare and tax on the other side. So I do think there is a latent capacity there that could be tapped into if the sector is able to ramp back up. We, we share your view, by the way, Deputy, about, I, I think you're, maybe I'm misinterpreting you, I hope I'm not, that you're expressing surprise at the fact that you have some very, very sizable house builders or people with land in this country and actually building a very small number of houses. And we would share your surprise at that. And uh, while we don't have the solution, uh, I think it's something that does need to be accelerated because, as I said in my opening statement, we will deliver what we can but we can't by any means bridge the gap between the 20,000 we're going to do and the 100,000 that's needed between now and 2020. Thank, thank you, Mr Daly. Deputy Cowan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank the, uh, for your presentation and the clarity contained within it. However, I think it, it would be necessary in future, if at all possible, to have more detail around the fact that local authorities are refusing units and the reasons why. And I pick on the points made by Deputy O'Dowd and I put down a question or sought further information recently from Dublin City Council myself in relation to um, offers that you had made to them. I think you offered them in the region of 828 units. You subsequently sold 190 of them yourselves. But within that, the main reason was indeed the tenure mix. That was the reason given by the local authority. Um, 638 were offered, 400 were taken. Um, 32 were in poor condition and structural issues. Eight, they claimed there was a low demand. 146 units in one development, um, where 198 had been offered, but they took they only took 48 of them because, again, of the tenure mix. And there was 46 turned down in Ballymun as well because of the tenure mix contained. In Ballymun, they're building. Um, demountable, what do you call them? Modular, Modular homes. Yeah. And a cost of 250000 They were to be up in 12 weeks, they're still not in place. Yeah. Them yesterday, sorry. Yeah, but I mean, how long did they take? How much did they cost? How much, how much, how much was the offers that was made by NAMA? What, what were their costs worth? This is the, you know, you made the point yourself. There's no provision in relation to affordable homes. The local development plan may be outdated in comparison to the situation that's on the ground today. And that's why I think it's incumbent on yourselves and the local authorities, if at all possible, to make available to this committee at a, at a later date more detailed analysis of what was offered, what was taken, why they weren't taken, for us to make a judgment on that in order to correct that issue, in order for the new minister to direct local authorities to be a bit more, to have a bit more resolve in the way in which they flippantly refuse units that have been made available while there's an emergency and a crisis out there. That's the point I'm making and that's the point I want addressed. Can I say, secondly, in relation to yourselves, you know, you've entered into many long-term leasing arrangements with local authorities and with housing associations. How does that sit with your lifespan? How does that sit with the dividend that is to be returned to the state? How does that sit with a dividend that has, when is it expected there be an interim dividend? When is your lifespan due to complete? And what dividend can the state expect? And while I respect and acknowledge the legislation governing your setup was of course one of a commercial mandate, but there was also mention of a social, a social mandate too. And maybe it's just that thankfully you may well be deemed profitable at the end of the day and the social mandate will accrue to the state at that stage. And the funding associated with that 
with any profitability will be used for the purpose of addressing the crisis we have at present and the emergency that's there at present. I think it's incumbent on the state and those with, with the authority within the state to make sure and to see that that funding is accessible and used for the right purposes from our perspective. Um, the other question I have is in relation to the lending rates that you may be charging to your clients, to your to developers. What are they on average? How do they compare to the open market? How do they compare uh, to the mezzanine funds for which the state is involved in some instances? Uh, what, what they are charging in comparison? Um, and you know, that may address the, the, the answer you just gave, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Daly, when you, when you said about the, you know, the state has a role to play in, in allowing the freeing up of 100,000 units. Uh, the state has a role to play if it charges appropriate rates, if it's involved by strategic investment funding being made available for rates to be charged at a rate that is competitive, that is real, and that can yield a dividend for those that are partaking in, in the development. Because at present, funding can't be got, and what funding can be got is at exorbitant rates, and is at uh, you know, only 60% funding being provided in some instances at exorbitant rates, and more exorbitant rates being charged by mezzanine funds to make up the difference that exists. In relation to Project Arrow, you mentioned that there were 425 units taken out for the purpose of, 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 of the potential uh, for, for a social dividend. What percentage of the entire portfolio, residential portfolio, did that entail? And in relation to the 20,000 units you hope to build by 2020, um, what, what obligation uh, has the state placed in your legislation in order to provide social units within that? Is it 10% as, or is it 20%? I know that the, the, the last government reduced part five from 20% to 10%. I didn't expressly agree with that. Uh, but I, I know where they were coming from, but I think they could have freed up ways and means by which development could take place and allow 20% to remain in place. And I refer back again to the 100,000 that are not being provided and the reasons why they're not being provided. But I think, could, you, could you enlighten us as to your obligations that have been placed upon you, if any, in that regard? Um, that's, that's the amount of question I have at the moment. Thank you, Deputy Count. Chairman, maybe I'll take the first question, and, and, uh, which is uh, really about the long-term future of MAMA and the surplus and what happens it, and uh, whether there is provision for an interim dividend, which uh, there isn't in the legislation. But first of all, I think there is little doubt at the moment that we will actually have a surplus of in excess of two billion, and that will go back to the exchequer. So uh, quite obviously it's a matter then for the government at the time to decide uh, what they do with that. The uh, reality of, uh, I suppose, what are we doing with the, the money we have, that the money we have generated, uh, obviously repaying the debt, and that is, you know, it, it's our top priority all the time because it has been and will remain a contingent liability on the Irish state. And if we don't repay that, it has implications in terms of access to money markets, confidence in Ireland, etc., etc. So there's a bigger issue there. And I've said before, in fact, that in fact, the biggest social dividend uh, indirectly that we can deliver is actually to pay that back as quickly as we can. We'll have that paid back, the senior debt, by 2018. We then have a small amount of subordinated debt, which is due to be paid on the 1st of March 2020. We will pay that on the due date. There's no advantage to anybody, or not least to the state, in repaying it earlier. Uh, and there will be other uh, things to be done then. NAMA, I suppose, in terms of its senior debt, will have its work done by 2018. But we will continue in the housing, uh, and we will continue in the Dublin Docklands. Uh, where we actually if you like, lease houses to housing bodies or whatever. Uh, in the terms of those leases, there is a provision where they, they can buy those out at a certain stage during the lease if they want to. But all of that is being done by a special purpose vehicle in NAMA. So that, the holding of all of those leases, that is an asset in itself. And at some stage, NAMA will be able to realise that asset and the value of that, again, will come into NAMA or indirectly from NAMA to the Exchequer. So that is what will happen there. Uh, but no doubt at all that there will be a surplus, no doubt at all that will go to the Exchequer. What the Exchequer does with it is a matter for, for government. There's no constraint on, on that. Uh, 
maybe if Brendan wants to talk about lending rates. Okay, sorry. I'll back, come back to some other questions, Chairman. Just, just Mr. Co Deputy Khan asked, you talked about the local authorities and, reason, and the reasons for refusal, refusal, and I think you appreciate, Deputy. We only, we, they tell us the reasons they're, they're turned down. We can certainly uh, put that together and send it to the committee. There's no issue with that. And the yeah, tenure mix is one of the big reasons of concentration. I mean, you said there was 32 units of poor condition of structure. I mean, what we've said all along to all the local authorities, if there's something there that is not currently of the standard which you wanted, we will bring it up to the standard. So there's no question that we weren't going to put funding in. This was just to correct that. In terms of uh, uh, lending rates, uh, we are charging uh, market uh, lending rates. Typically, our margin uh, is, is um, you know, 89 percent over. Um, a, a six months you arrive. So, and uh, that is comparable with the rates that are available in the market. Everybody talks about these high rates charged for the tech, but that's only for an element. If I might just explain that you typically in the banks will lend senior debt at 5% coupon. So that's for about 60% of the, of, 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 of the thing. So if you 60 by 5%, that's 3%. Uh, you'll borrow, you, you, you can borrow equity from, uh, for about 10% of it, which is at about 20% coupon, so sort of 10 by 20, the weight average is 2%. And for the mezzanine piece in the middle, that used to be up around 12%, but we know now a number of mezzanine financiers who are out there have reduced their rates because rates have gone negative in the central banks and they have to make money. They've reduced their rates typically towards 10%, so, uh, so 30 by 10% is 3%. So when you add the 2 plus the 3 plus the 3, five is about eight percent so the market you, you can typically borrow for eight to nine percent from the private sector and we're charging uh, the same sort of rates and we have to because there's state aid considerations that you would you would you would, you would, appre you would appreciate um in terms of part five obligations uh, uh nama debtors uh, are the same as any other uh, builder in the market, and they have to be. Uh, uh, they have to be. They want to be treated the same as other builders. So, if, they, if other builders have, who are not in AMA have only 10% obligations to provide Part Five, then the AMA debtors have a 10% obligation to, part, to provide part, part Five. It's a policy matter, Deputy. You'd appreciate, and whether they should have said at 20% or moved to 10%, but whatever the the law is, then that's what will be uh, complied with. So our debtors have the same obligations as other people uh, in the market. And your, your question, uh, question on Arrow, I don't have that detail with me, but we'll commit to come, Martin will come back to the committee with that information, if that's okay with you. Thank you. Uh, just, just before I go to Deputy Dirk, and just to follow on one point from um, Deputy Cowan. Um, Mr. Daly, in, in relation to the special companies that you've set up, NAMA has put something like 160 million in, and those properties are now leased to voluntary bodies and so forth. The funding mechanism for that, is that off the state's balance sheet? Yeah. And I yes. suppose then the follow on question from that, is there further scope to develop this special vehicle? Yeah. Yeah. And would you like to comment on that? Well, it is, it is off the state's balance sheet, which has always been the, I suppose, unique advantage of, of NAMA, and, and uh, we would want to keep it that way. Uh, so it is always possible, yes, to develop it for that concept within NAMA uh, for other purposes, or elsewhere, indeed. Uh, Without meaning to push you on it, um, you're talking about... You're bringing me into policy. <laughs> well, uh, you've embarked on this project, so I'm just yeah. expanding where it could yeah. go. And the point I suppose I'm specifically making is you're also indicating uh, NAMA, NAMA returning to the state, you know, a, a surplus at some point in time in, in the, the near future. And I'm wondering, what are the constraints on NAMA uh, advancing, I suppose, this special company, special vehicle company, uh, that it becomes more active and more engaged in the housing market as there's a crisis. But uh, don't forget, there is, well, go on, there's a constraint on this. But, yeah. but I suppose, first of all, in, in terms of this, like when we're buying the units, we, we, buy them from NAM, we, we buy them from NAMA debtors. I mean, the European Commission approval of NAMA that came through said you have to just deal with NAMA debtors, you're not dealing with the things. So whatever our debtors produce. And we would, like, I mean, we will continue to buy units into this special purpose vehicle called NARPS and do the lease to the proof housing bodies. As soon as the proof housing body confirms, they will do the lease to us. And in fact, just this week, we have agreed a deal with Dunleary County Council in terms of uh, 124 units in Dunleary new build. 
uh, uh, that effectively we w we will we will buy them and and lease them back uh, to them. So you know uh, you know we are making use of our resources wh wherever possible. But you know we've proven that we developed this concept. We've proven the concept, and it is very open to other people to uh, copy that concept. And in fact. You know, Martin here uh, has had meetings with the credit union movement, and we believe they're very interested in the concept that we've been able to show them how it works. So, effectively, what you create is a, is, is a vehicle which has spent the money, bought the assets on the balance sheet, then does a lease, and effectively, it's an income into that company. And you know, um, over time, it becomes like a government bond. The money is coming in per annum uh, on that, and uh, you are. Uh, Effectively, it's something a product that we believe would be very interested that someone like an insurance company would be interested in buying in the future because effectively it buys an income stream like a government bond from them. So, all it needs is a, is, is 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 a bit uh, a bit of management. You probably need about two people to run this entity, and you can put thousands of units into it. We 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 developed this from scratch, and we we we've, we've streamlined it with leases. We we know that we 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 know the, the legal contracts and things of this. This is not you know I keep saying this. This is technical, but it, it's it, it eminently doable. All you need is the money to be able to put into it. And if you've got other people like insurance companies want to put money in to put to to buy it, to buy product in it, or the credit union movement or other funds, uh, it can be done, and it's it's not a huge overhead. Thank you, Mr. McDonough. Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A number of questions. Uh, in respect of, the, for example, the Dunleary offer, um, the, the, that uh, project is off uh, the government balance sheet, I presume. Well, it's a private sector transaction. Effectively, it's done at market value. Yeah. Yeah. But you, 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 you purchase the property and yeah. you're leasing them back to yeah. the local authority. Our approved housing body, if the local authority sometimes get approved. Uh, Chairman, is it, is it the local authority or an approved housing body? Well, it, well, it, well it, it, sometimes the local authority does the leases, or for some of them, and sometimes the approved housing body does okay. the leases. Yeah. Next question is: is, uh, is there an obligation on NAMA to inquire as to the use the property is like to be put? Uh, for example, uh, when the property is being disposed, would it not be wise in the interests of NAMA and the interests of the, the, the taxpayer? Uh, to inquire as to what was likely to happen to the property, whether it be house, houses already built or, or potential development land. For example, uh, to find out whether they intended, the buyer intended to hold on to it for a couple of years in order to appreciate its value, and particularly when, when, when interest rates are low and the possibility of, uh, of uh, investment in, in, in the financial sector giving a much lower dividend. Uh, we, we, would, you, would, would you be expected to inquire as to uh, what they propose to do and how long they intend to hold on to it, and is there an obligation on, on NAMA to do that? Do, do you want to give all the questions together? I do indeed. Daddy. Okay, well, they're, 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 they're coming up. There's more than coming up. Uh, the, the, some local authorities are reluctant to um, take up the offers you made, uh, made to them. Were they all um, properties that were suitable? Uh, for families, or were the, some of the properties deemed to be unsuitable? And uh, to what extent uh, have you examined that with a view to identifying what best to make available to the local authorities in the future if there, were, if there was a particular uh, reason? Uh, the extent to which an examination has been done of the, the, the cost of building a house, the, the square foot uh, uh, cost of building a house, we know that ex excluding the land, uh, uh, we, we have had varying offers uh, and, and, and projections in that area over the past few days. Uh, to what extent have you done that? And uh, to what extent have you uh, added in the land value then after that, and, and, and after that the, the tax, the tax Im impact? And do you appreciate that it is virtually impossible for an average family uh, with an average income to purchase a house on the market? Keeping in mind the requirements of the central bank, keeping in, the, in, in relation to um, deposits, and keeping in mind, obviously, the necessity to, to keep house property inflation down, and recognising that in 1978 uh, housing was, was, was removed from the CPI uh, register. Uh, on that basis, it was deemed that, uh, that uh, because it was showing uh, um, rapid inflation, and when that was removed uh, from the CPI register, uh, it would appear to me 
that there was a huge inflation in house property that wasn't visible before that. Can I also ask, the, in relation to the local authorities, whether uh, I, I should mention, Mr. Chairman, I'm not in favour of selling to, to, to uh, uh, private or approved bodies. They have failed to deliver the housing requirement and abysmally failed. And nothing is ever going to change that unless and until the local authorities take direct responsibility and the local authorities are recognised as the, the most likely and eligible uh, body to provide the alternative housing to the private sector. Can I ask, uh, the, uh, in, in, in relation to the local authorities, uh, it would appear to me from my investigations that the, the majority of options were for the private housing or approved housing bodies and not for the local authorities, and it wasn't possible for the local authorities to access, well you can tell us that in a minute now, uh, to access, to access on, given the, uh, the um, uh, balance sheet issue. And uh, the, so the hoarding, the hoarding issue, uh, an, inquire, an inquiry at, at the purchaser intended to hoard, or for what purpose? And it, would, would NAMA be aware of some of the properties that they've acquired over the past number of years, um, in the course of the downturn? That some of those uh, lands and properties were the subject of multiple turnovers in terms of ownership over a period of time, each of which inflated the price of the property hugely, the ultimate property hugely. In some cases, up to 10 times the properties were turned over, each time with a profit to the speculator. So the question that arises there is, is are adequate efforts being made to ensure that properties are not disposed of to speculators? I have no difficulty about somebody making a profit, but there are profits and profits, and we are now talking with a vital piece of national infrastructure, which is housing for the people. The last question is, is, is uh, in relation to Kildare County Council, uh, the, the body which I was a member of for more than a few years, Chairman. Uh, 298 uh, um, um, offered houses, uh, I presume were houses that were made available. And what was the reason that they weren't able to take up, the, up those houses? Was it because they were unsuitable, which is what I, I, I've been informed, uh, in the wrong place? which was a possibility, uh, or uh, was, was there some other reason? And the last question is, um, yeah, to what extent um, in the context of the overall cost to the, to the state of the properties purchased uh, uh, by NAM, some at, at, at um, uh, a huge write down, some of a huge write down, some some 40% of, 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 of uh, face value at the time, some at less. How have those properties uh, progressed in the interim period? In other words, if you paid 100 million uh, for a set of properties or, or, or a group of properties, how were they appreciated in the period? How much, in comparison, how does your profit range? How much you paid for them? How much they're worth now, and could you be hoarding them? Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Mr. McDonough, just the, the issue of the properties that were not taken up by the local authorities have come up a number of times, so to try and address it for everyone, I suppose the question I'd ask is, do you have the detailed replies from each local authority, or does this committee need to address to approach each local authority directly to look for that information, or it'll, it'll keep coming up as we yeah, go. Well, well, effectively, what actually happened here, Deputy, was that all the coordination of the local authorities' reasons to take them or not take them was done through the, the housing agency, uh, and uh, they were the people who told us that the local authority didn't, didn't want them. The local authority told them, and they told us. So that's it. So we have information. We believe we have to go through our files in terms of uh, what. what, what to the well, yeah, well, yeah uh, 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 as much as, as we have, deputy, we actually we, we give it to committee. But the best people who actually has the central coordination role is John O'Connor, chief executive of the housing agency. Okay? Thank you. Now, deputy Durkin, oh, okay, a series okay. of questions. Um, you, the first question, Deputy, is in terms of when we sell properties, uh, should we inquire in terms of what the buyer has done to them? I mean, our properties are openly marketed, wherever, where, uh, you know, and you know, you have all ty different types of buyers bidding on, bidding on the properties, and uh, the buyers won't, necess won't uh, uh, advise you what they're doing to them. I mean, clearly, if, if somebody buys an income-producing property, they might keep it for, the for, for getting, the, getting the income on it, but if they're buying land, 
then effectively they're tying up their money and there's no income really coming on it, uh, coming on that. So they obviously have to have a, a different rationale for holding them. They might well say, listen, I just put that money away. But I mean, in terms of even if uh, even if we do know reasons why uh, people are, people are, people are buying them, once somebody buys them, like yourself, you buy your house and you might have somebody else then you can say to them, I'm going to buy that, I'm going to live in it, and you might live in it at all. Uh, you know, that you're not necessarily going to achieve much on, on the back of that. It would be things of this, would be my view. Haven't you got a different obligation? Haven't you a responsibility to the state that an ordinary open market seller doesn't have? In order to, for instance, you, you, you don't have to accept uh, the highest bidder, for example, if, if the guy wanted or the purchaser wanted to go on holidays on the basis of his profits over the next 20 years, you don't have to accept that. Given that there's a requirement uh, over which you have some control to, to deliver something to the state. I'm sorry, Chairman, for interrupting. But, 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 but the reality is, is that, Deputy, if you think about this, if a debtor owes a huge amount of money, he wants to sell that property for the best value he can to pay off as much of his debt as possible. And if there's a receiver in place, the receiver actually has a legal obligation to take the best price. So he can't, he, that, that, that's actually a legal obligation on him. So he can't accept, uh, he has a very good reason for not accepting the best price. So both, the receiver that are, are, are both incentivized to, uh, uh, to, to get the best price for it. Uh, you know, our obligation, like any secured lender, is do we decide to release our security on the basis of the price that, 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 is, that is offered. You talk about local authorities' reluctance and, uh, you know, you said sometimes they said it was suitable, unsuitable. Is it, is, it a, is it a house, is it an apartment? In the day? I mean, what we did, Deputy, was that we offered up what is available in the portfolio and said it's houses, it's, a, it's apartments, it's a two-bedroom apartment, one-bedroom apartment, whatever it is, and we say, listen, is it any use to you? And you can make the decision whether you take it or not, and they can make their own decisions uh, on the back of that. Uh, you talked about the, 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 cost, the, the cost of building, and I mean, that, as I said there in, in the presentation, if I could take you forward, Deputy, in, the, in my presentation, to page um, 20, uh, you know, we have this society, the Society of Charter Surveyors, where they benchmark the building costs. I mean, we have seen that. We've looked at ourselves with our own in-house quantities, uh, quantity surveyors and seen what some of our, our debtors are doing as well. And it, it, it's a reasonable representation of, uh, of the costs involved in terms of build-out. It does take account of the VAT uh, on a typical 300,000 house. is about 30,000 goes to the Exchequer. Uh, local authority costs and uh, planning costs and things like this. And, and finance costs come to about 46,000. And the site cost is typically... Uh, in Dublin, up to 40,000 per unit on average, and outside Dublin, uh, less uh, less than that. So there is a, there is certainly, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's it's pretty well uh, benchmarked. And people, we we often hear people talking about the big issue here is about driving down the cost of construction. Uh, uh, but uh, the reality is that, uh, as you see from one of my charts there, the cost of construction you thought would have fallen dramatically during the recession, and it didn't. It was effectively flatlined. And the reason for that is that a lot of the costs, when the costs of construction are fixed, which effectively are effectively uh, uh, union agreements in terms of pay rates, which haven't changed. And, uh, and uh, fall dramatically in fairness, that's no, completely... No, no, no but it, it, for people who are in, under registered employment contracts, the, the rates haven't changed, Deputy. All on self-employment contracts well, now. Well, there is a certain cost uh, in it. And Five euro now. Yes, so, uh, but, uh, but there's also other costs in there which are you know, linked to external factors like cost of, cost of materials. In terms of... Uh, you said there about the uh, the central, you know, the central bank rules. They certainly have had had an effect of, of dampening, of, of of dampening the market, and it is I do accept it's very difficult for people uh, to get a mortgage, especially start their, start their home when people are starting off, and that is certainly 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 an issue. Um, uh, you mentioned there about Kildare, and we'll have a look at that and come back to you as part of the general response in terms of the local authorities. And you talked in about NAMA asset values changed since inception. I mean, when we got the loans in 
2010 and 2011, the board made a strategic decision that actually we would sell very little in Ireland because the market was continuing to, to fall. So between 2010 and 2012, there was only a bit, 1 billion euros worth of property sold from the NAMA portfolio. We concentrated on selling the overseas assets. And it's only when the Irish market began to recover, we, 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 we have sold additional units into uh, uh, different pro properties into the market. And I mean, we paid the banks we paid the banks by reference to a date of 30 November 2009, what the valuation was on that date. And between 2009 and 2012, property values dropped by 30%. And now, uh, you know, uh, they're back up again. And if you look even at the residential CSO index, uh, I think it fell about over over fi about over 50%. And now it's, it's recovered somewhat now, but they're still 33% down from, from, from their peak. So, you know, we're not immune from, from what it is. I mean, the commercial market is, is, in Dublin is, is completely different because at the peak, rents for commercial office space in Dublin in 2007 were about, I think, about an average of about 55 euros a square foot. And they went down to 27 euros a square foot rent. And now they're back up towards 55 euros a square foot. Uh, that's and the cost of building. Uh, the cost of building really hasn't changed that much for a commercial building. It, it, it is a, it's, it is it is it is typically around 35 euros a square foot. So you know, but I mean, it, a lot of that is, is a factor of demand in the market. There's been a lot of FDI the investment, and people are coming in and they're they're renting uh, the space. And there isn't there's a lot of new product in the pipeline which will come available in to, from 2018 onwards. But uh, but uh, until that comes uh, comes available, there isn't probably there is an issue about commercial office space uh, in Dublin. So I think there are all your questions, Deputy. Well, Lastly, just one second, sorry. please, Deputy. Uh, just Mr. Reid. Local authorities had had access to the social houses that we offered. It really was a two-step process, uh, Chairman. In the first instance, local authorities are responsible as the uh, housing authority in any functional area to determine whether there is demand or not, and they do that by reference to their own housing strategies. So the first step in this process was a confirmation or otherwise from local authorities. Thereafter, if demand was confirmed, we worked through the housing agency to make the units available in whatever way was deemed the most uh, uh, appropriate and the most efficient. In most instances, the, because of the capital constraints that you raised, rightly raised, the preference was for long-term leasing. And as the NAMA CEO has said, rather than trying to recreate the wheel for every single lease, that's why NARPS was set up. So local authorities, by all means, had, had first option in terms of taking the units themselves. But it has to be said that because of capital constraints, the big focus moved to long-term leasing. And it's been through NARPS that we've sought to expedite or sought to yeah, facilitate and, that. And, and all our units were made available, Deputy, to the housing agency who then uh, went to local authorities and said, "There's so many apartments, there's so many houses, whatever, and they are in in Kildare. You know, they might be in Salins, they might be in Nace, uh, they might be in Newbridge or Kildare Town or wherever it is. And, and what we did, we offered them up, and then it came back to the housing local authority, back to the housing agency, back to us, and mm -hmm. say, we only want ten in Kildare Town, we only want six in Nace or whatever the case is. That was completely their decision. And what, and as I said earlier on." The reality is that as soon, if we had 10 more left in ACE that the local authority didn't take, the reality is that our debtor went out and uh, advertised them in the private market and he rented them very quickly because the demand was there. But whether the local authority took them or not uh, it, it, it was their decision. The overhang, overhang question, Chairman, is the, the, the one that, that I'm, I'm still a, a bit at sea about. Uh, where, where you, uh, NAMA has acquired a property that had achieved a hugely inflated value, hugely inflated cost or value, <laughs> which I'm not certain, uh, cost I would say, hugely inflated cost, by virtue of repeated speculation beforehand, are you expected to make a profit? Well, the words of what I'm trying to say is that if that property comes onto the market, it has the impact of inflating property prices artificially now by borrowing, by borrowing what happened in the past. No, definitely. I mean, what happens is that when property is put on the market, it is put on the market by reference to, if it goes on the market today, whatever the market value is today. And, you know, um, you know, people let on that there's a huge amount of science in this business and, and, and there isn't. Uh, effectively, a lot of it is based on house down, equivalent house down the road sold for 
250,000. This is a similar type of house that's going to be advertised in the market at 250,000, and then people will bid on that with the local auctioneer or whatever the case is, uh, and buy the house for whatever they think the value is worth. That's that's the way the market works. Thank you, Mr. McDonough. Deputy O'Brien. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Um, Frank, you said earlier that repaying the debt uh, was NAMA's top priority. Uh, and of course, I don't need to remind you that that's not what the NAMA Act says. Uh, it gives you a number of, of tasks. Uh, and as you know, uh, Section 2, Part 8 talks about contributing to the social and economic development of the state. You did go on to say that, in your view, repaying the debt is the best social dividend. But I would have thought at a time when the economy is growing, the debt to GDP ratio in general is falling. But as we see today, 6,000 people uh, are now homeless from figures released by the Department of Environment today, 2,000 children. That in fact, uh, the calculations as to what is the best social dividend should be a mixture between uh, the more clearly social requirements to do more to tackle the housing crisis uh, and the repaying the debt. And I say that because, uh, and I'll come to the questions in a second, my concern is, is that in a lot of the work that NAMA has done, and I do acknowledge that NAMA has played a role in increasing social housing stock in the state, but that in the main it has been driven more by the commercial calculations to the detriment of, of that crucial part of NAMA's uh, legislative remit. So for example, we've had a lot of talk about the 6,700 uh, units, and I would hate the message to go out from here today that somehow local authorities are refusing units. There's this thing called central government that people seem to forget that places enormous constraints on local authorities in terms of what they can accept when NAMA presents uh, a property. So for example, South Dublin County Council, there was 591 uh, units uh, that NAMA proposed. Almost 500 of them were in the one location. Central government policy, both under the last government and this, and I'm just making the point, does not allow local authorities to buy 500 units in the one location. Even if the council wanted to do it, they're constrained by central government policy. Many of these units were offered in 2011, uh, 2012, and not only was tenure mix a constraint from central government, uh, but location and cost <coughs> and the availability of resources at a time that central government funding to local authorities was at its lowest. So I just, I think we should explore this, and I think people are right to ask the questions. But it's a little bit like the headline in the examiner yesterday that was criticizing local authorities for not spending the capital allocations. What nobody is mentioning is the procurement and tendering process insisted upon by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform takes a year and a half. So, you know, it's not the fact that local authorities are sitting there just not spending money. I, so I'm just making that point only because I think it needs a bit of balance uh, to the, the debate. It, it appeared to be helpful because a number of people are raising this issue about the one, the, I think, I think as a committee we'll also get correspondence from the housing agency I know, because I, just, I think you want that clarity. I, uh, across the, across yeah, it's, not true, it's, it's, it's not that I want clarity. I've just, no, but as a committee. I've, I've just come from a local authority uh, as a councillor where we've worked quite extensively on this uh, uh, and we understand some of these dynamics and I'm just conscious that these sessions are in public and it is important that rather than just saying local authorities simply aren't taking units that the picture is more complex. I'm just putting uh, rather, it on the record. The year and a half is, Durkin, is not true, please, Jeff. Please, not true. Deputy Durkin. But it's not true. Deputy Durkin. We're well, it still isn't true. No, no. De That's the please, point. Deputy O'Brien, you. You're, two months, you're, two months, three months. Excuse me, and Deputy Durkin. Max. Play, Deputy Durkin. Bernard. It's, de it's Deputy O'Brien to question the witness. Bernard. Without interruption. We had two of the most senior housing managers in the country at our first session from Dublin City and South Dublin. And they told us, in fact, that once planning is passed, the tendering of procurement can take a year and a half to two years. Now, there is a shortened process that was made available in the rapid build in Ballymun, but that is only currently available for those rapid builds. Uh, and while the department is looking at possibly applying it elsewhere, that hasn't been the case up till now. So they're the facts that have been presented to the committee. My, my questions are these, Chair. First of all, the report talks about 1,647 units that were originally offered to the local authorities, but then were subsequently sold or leased uh, on to the private market. I'm interested to know, were they rejected, were they part of the original pool that were rejected by local authorities, or was the decision to put them into the private market a commercial decision in NAMA, or was it a mix uh, of the two? I also have a concern that 
one of, the, one of the problems for local authorities and approved housing bodies is that the leasing model, even the more streamlined and standardised leasing model uh, that has emerged, is still very, very cumbersome, particularly for approved housing bodies. And I'm just wondering to what extent are NAM aware of that uh, and to what extent, particularly in the context of, of the uh, uh, NARPS vehicle, there's attempts to try and make it easier for approved housing bodies to function. Because one of the things they're telling us quite a lot is it's really tricky and really cumbersome and it does delay their ability to bring more social units uh, online. I'd be interested in more, more detail on just how things with the SPV are going, particularly following the kind of additional role that it was given by Alan Kelly in social housing 2020. I know there's been like over 100 meetings of, of the kind of working group over the last while, but just if you can give the committee more information about what it's doing and what you're hoping its output is going to be, that would be useful. On the 20,000 private sector units, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is that the, the new Part 5 requirements will obviously apply to those as they would do for any uh, other commercial development. And I suppose, given the, the, the scale of the housing crisis, uh, and given again uh, my point at the start about the social dividend, does NAMA not think it might not be more appropriate to increase that? Have there been discussions about increasing that to 20 or 25 per cent, which certainly is, is what I would argue for? We also haven't had a discussion about land, uh, and again, I know NAMA doesn't own land, just like NAMA doesn't own the units, it, it holds the debts. But in two particular areas, I mean, in Fingal, and I'm sure Ruth will talk about this better than I would, one of the problems for the local authority is the absence of publicly owned land. And therefore, is there land uh, that uh, NAMA has a relationship with debtors, uh, that as part of uh, meeting your social dividend under Section 2 of the Act, you could look at actually transferring that land at, uh, at no cost or low cost to the state for the provision of social housing. And in the Clonborough SDZ, and again, Frank, you spoke about SDZs and, and the benefits, I mean, there is the last major piece of development land in South Dublin County Council. Uh, the vast majority of it, maybe two thirds of it, are privately owned, and I, I assume there's a chunk of that land uh, for which the debtors have a relationship with NAMA. And again, in terms of maximising the delivery of social units, are there some innovative ideas that could be brought there that haven't currently has certainly been in the public domain that you'd like to talk about. The Programme for Government talks about future NAMA surplus invested in infrastructure and social housing. One of the ideas, in fact, might not be giving the money back to the Exchequer because the Exchequer might have obligations under the EU fiscal rules, but actually transferring portions of that surplus in other assets, in land or in houses. Is that being considered? Is that something that the Act would permit? Because, uh, again, that could be a useful way of bringing some of that forward. On the house construction costs, I'd really like to see the research, uh, but if you could tell us a little bit on, on, on what data is, are the figures that you presented here based? Is it an assessment of how many units across what period of time over how many counties? Because everybody who comes to this committee is giving us a very different uh, account of this. And if you have more detailed research, certainly I'd really like to see the data upon which it's based. I'm sure the committee would, and I'd ask you give us that. On the... Deficits, the infrastructural deficits and the proposal of 164 million. Could you tell us a little bit about what those infrastructural deficits are and how are they different to the things that a developer would ordinarily pay development levies to the local authority to provide or other levies to the likes of ESB or Irish Water, etc.? And then my last question is on the SPV model, and this is maybe just taking a little bit of liberty since you, you mentioned Martin's expertise in this. A lot of us, uh, including the new government in the programme from government, are talking about the possibility of arm's length companies or municipal housing trusts as another vehicle for having off balance sheet spending, albeit in this case in social housing. Does the model that you're talking about, could it be applicable not just to private sector interests like insurance companies or the credit unions, and certainly the credit unions I'd welcome, uh, but also, for example, to municipal housing trusts or arm's length companies that would be operated by local authorities for the purposes of increasing direct social housing, but albeit off balance sheet? Thank you very much, Deputy. Uh, Mr Daly, Mr McDonough, there's a, a range of questions. And by the way, one, one question when you're addressing, uh, it's the, in relation to the uh, the constrained units and the development. The, you indicate there's 48,000 constrained units in the, across the four local authorities in Dublin. How many of those units would fall under the remit of NAMA? Okay, if we can uh, maybe start with the first point, which is, is about um, NAMA being driven by commercial uh, priorities and that. I suppose you have to go back really to the, the Act itself, the purposes of the Act and the purposes of NAMA. Uh, and the purposes of the, of the Act. Uh, 
and I agree that there is a clause in the Act about a social dividend, but it's very firmly in the Act and clear in the Act, I think, that the main purposes of the Act were to restore the economic, uh, to deal with the economic difficulties in the state and what NAMA could actually do in terms of addressing that. And it's quite clear in Section section of the Act doesn't prioritise any of those eight objectives. No, section 10 of the Act is very clear in that NAMA has a commercial remit and that its objective must be to get the best financial return for the state. And really that one, sort of, our reading of the Act, our understanding of the Act, that is the primary purpose and that is the one that overrides everything else. Uh, so I think that is, you know, that is what drives us. But it's, what also drives us is our belief that actually uh, the debt, whether it be the 32 billion that we started off with, or the 7 billion senior debt that's there now, that while that's there, it's a contingent liability on the state, and it impacts in the greater sense on the state's uh, standing in the money markets as capacity to borrow. The very fact that the state can borrow at extremely low rates at the moment. Part of that, and this has been acknowledged by the markets and by the rating agencies, is due to the fact that NAMA was quite clear about its commitment to repay that debt. And in fact, one of those Moody's, and you may not think much of these rating agencies, and I have views on them myself, uh, but they did declare not too long ago that NAMA is no longer a material contingent liability on the Irish state. So all of that is, is important. Uh, but I would say that on top of that, we have used the, the cash we have generated not just to repay the debt, but also to, and it's, a lot of it has been mentioned here today, in terms of uh, social housing, buying the units, refurbishing the units, in terms of working out um, ghost estates, in terms of working with local authorities and local bodies with, for places for schools, sites for schools, local communities, all of that. So there is a kind of a social overhang to everything that we do. But unless we are actually commercial, and unless we generated the funds that we did over the last uh, seven years, we wouldn't be able to do any of that. We wouldn't be funding 20,000 houses between now and 2020. We wouldn't have been able to deal with the social housing uh, issue that we're talking about today. So I suppose I'm, I, I want to make that kind of general point. Um, most of, I think a lot of the other questions relate to detail about units, and the chairman has already referred to, uh, to that. We will give you as much detail as we can in terms of why the local authorities. We didn't, by the way, haven't come in here to criticise the local authorities in any way. And, and we're, more to do with know, some of my colleagues in that it's respect. More, but it's, it's perhaps more, more general. And I think you got into other wider policy areas which have nothing to do uh, with NAMA. The reality is we have found the local authorities uh, quite effective to deal with, by and large. And we also, I suppose, to go back to Deputy Durkin, who was uh, somewhat critical of the housing bodies. Uh, uh, we haven't, by and large, found that. We have, by and large, again, found it uh, quite a productive and a useful relationship with those, with those bodies. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of things, a lot of things perhaps, uh, we won't agree on. Um, on the land that we have, and I think we mentioned the figure earlier, we have about 2,800 hectares of land in NAMA, but if about 1,500 acres, hectares of that is required to deliver NAMA's 2020 target, to deliver the 20,000 houses. Uh, and the balance is land that we're, we're looking at it all the time in terms of see what is the capability, what are the possibilities here. But to be honest with you, Deputy, a lot of it is land that will probably never be built on. Uh, a lot of it is land that uh, is in, was bought with hope value and will probably go back to agriculture use. Uh, but we are continually... On land, that wouldn't apply. It's no, not, no, it wouldn't apply. It's not a constrained land. land yeah. But we are continually scouring our portfolio. Uh, and we've always been doing that, but I mean, we've, we had a meeting yesterday actually with the, the Minister for Housing, which was very useful. Uh, and again, he has encouraged us to look again and again at our portfolio and see is there more we can find for social housing. Uh, and we have said we will. And we are confident that we can come up with several hundred additional units, uh, which we will offer to the local authorities as soon as we possibly can. We'll be doing that fairly soon. 
so we'll continue to do that all the time. And we'll continue to look at the uh, possibilities around the 20,000 units that we hope to deliver by 2020. Can we do it faster? Maybe we can, can we do it some more? Don't forget there's a state aid complaint in Brussels, which we have to be very careful about. Uh, and I suppose in some ways that goes back to your earlier point. Uh, that state aid complaint, the substance of it, a, or the substantive defence to it, is that NAMA is acting commercially. And the day we stop acting commercially in that area is the day we'll be in trouble with Brussels. I don't think anybody wants that, because that really only has the potential to, to hold things up and perhaps not get even the 20,000 houses uh, built that NAMA is proposing to. I think there are other maybe questions there which I might ask Brendan or Martin to take. Okay. Deputy, in relation to, you said, the 1,647 sold or leased, I mean, we have a live portfolio uh, and uh, our debtors are anxious to, uh, if they have an opportunity to sell at a good price, they want to sell and it's very hard to stop uh, to stop that happening. Or if they say, listen, it's already we kept it vacant for three months and look, our TD has come back and uh, our housing agency hasn't told us, uh, then they would just they would just be leased again to the private sector. It's just the nature of a life portfolio in terms of this. You talk about lease being cumbersome. Don't accept that at all, deputy, because effectively we've done the leases now with nearly every nearly all the major approved housing bodies, and they're well used to the lease uh, of, of the lease now. And and there's no tricks in the lease. It's a, you know it's a standard it's a it's a standard format. At the start, we do accept that they had their own formal lease, and each local authority had their own or approved body housing body had their own formal lease, and they didn't want to move away from that. But we've said, listen, we're going to do with our with our lease and. They came around to accept it. I know it's like everybody finds it difficult to change, but we, we, we try to do the same for everybody. Uh, you talked about, as uh, Mr. former Minister Kelly's uh, various working groups, we're not particularly uh, uh, directly involved in that. We Members of my team are involved in as some working groups arising out of Construction 2020, uh, where effectively they're looking at uh, various things like infrastructure, planning, what's, you know, you know there's various working uh, groups that are rising out of that, and uh, we we are participating in that as much as in terms of that, that that is relevant. Uh, you talked in about uh, giving land free to local authority. We can't under Section 10. We have to get uh, the debtor will insist and the receiver will insist that he gets market market value for it. But we have facilitated the passing of land to uh, state uh, uh, bodies where at market value if if if, if they put up their hand and said and said they want it. You talked about the Clambers SDZ in terms of renovations. We we're all for uh, in, uh, in, uh, innovations. Some SDZs that were done previously haven't worked, to be honest with you. Uh, the high profile ones there that probably, it's probably Cherrywood is not, uh, it was an SDZ that hasn't hasn't worked out. There's sort of uh, issues around that. There's a, a, a rest as well, so like a hands down and things that haven't quite worked. So, you know, we have a very good relationship with South Dublin County Council and an excellent manager there, Mr. McLaughlin. And uh, we, our planning team ha has lots of engagement with him in terms of our experience of SDZs and, you know, and whatever is going to produce the best outcome, we're all, we're all, we're all for that. Um, you talked about uh, the programme for go uh, government talks about the surplus and whether the surplus doesn't have to be cash or can it be something else. That's actually already provided for under the NAM Act under Section 60 because it says you ought to give back cash that's at the end or if you residual assets, you can give residual assets. So if we've unsold assets, uh, that can certainly be done. Uh, on the house, uh, house cost info, uh, I mean, uh, we'll come back to you with detail on that. We do have our own internal QSs on that. and. Uh, we've, we've looked at them with our, with our debtors as well. There isn't a huge variation at this stage, and that's why I brought the CSI because I felt, in fairness, them as an industry body, they, you know, sometimes industry bodies uh, might have their own agenda, but they actually, in fairness, uh, produce something that we think is, is, is not unreasonable. Uh, you talked about the infrastructure deficit uh, uh, types. I mean, typically roads, sewerage. Water uh, are, are the typical things, and yes, uh, uh, developers in previous times, in the good times, used to borrow money from the banks and pay for the infrastructure. That day is gone because nobody, including NAMA, will give all the money up front, and then suddenly there's no product at the end of it because we want product at the end of it. And US Chairman, 
I think about of the 48,000 that's uh, that in Dublin that needs that. How, how many of them are, are in in uh, in Nama? We, we, roughly 13 to 14,000 of that. So uh, and uh, we uh, certainly would, uh, uh, and we are very anxious that the local authorities would, would do that. And and uh, we have good engagement with the. Uh, Department of Environment now, Minister, or now the, the Housing uh, Department, of actually telling them actually what the deficits are. So, uh, but they're fully aware of them in in in, in 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 fairness. And you talked about the SPV and things like this. Uh, this is a model, as I said, uh, that can that can be replicated. All it needs is funding, and effectively, if you have funding that can has the capital to buy the housing stock. Uh, then it can do the leasing to local authorities, and you know I do accept your point, deputy, that effectively the local authorities are constrained because their capital budgets are taken, and I couldn't buy them, and that's why we did the leasing model. I said we do recognise they don't have the capital to buy it, uh, or the approved housing bodies on the capital to buy it, but but I think one of the big points here is that in, if you look at the UK uh, as uh, as a model. Uh, there was a, uh, there has been a move on there effectively where you had a, a large number of approved housing bodies they sort of uh, enforced a, mer a merger among them and effectively then they had a lot of stock on their balance sheet which was funded by capital grants over the years and they uh, get these approved housing bodies then effectively to be like municipal vehicles as you said they borrow money on the strength of the existing stock on their balance sheet and use that to buy new stock and that's something something that i would welcome and i think that's something that's that's innovative that can that can that can, that can certainly be looked at to leverage up uh, and a sensible way uh, to do that so one question that wasn't answered apologies uh, increasing the part five element oh, of the 20,000 oh, units yeah well, well, well as I said deputy about about this problem but it was about our debtors and um, receivers are got the same legal obligations as as, as non naba debtors and it, and they would certainly say to us that they're not going to be disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis the non naba debtors that they would have to provide more than 10% uh, because it would affect uh, uh, the profitability in their schemes in terms of them trying to, to maximise the repayment of the repayment of, 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 of their debt. I think the issue here again is it's a policy decision is that whatever if the people could say it shouldn't be ten percent, it should be fifteen percent what is whatever applies and whatever the law applies it will be complied with uh, by, our de by, by our debtors. But uh, I certainly think it would be very hard uh, to uh, signal them out uh, different to uh, other people who are operating in the market and put them at a disadvantage, but you might have different views. You guys are funding them, and that doesn't happen with their competitors who are outside well, of But that's a, well, a separate issue. Well, their debtors, the competitors are being funded, and you know there are other people in the market who are building houses who've got a lot of institutional money now as well. So, uh, you know, the market is the market, deputy, and uh, I think uh, we we. I, I mean, this is about. Uh, Getting more houses, more housing stock built, and I, I think uh, uh, they are, uh, that's the most important thing. But it's a huge demand uh, and um, a huge crisis. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Deputy Coppinger. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask some questions about NAMA's role in actually contributing to the housing crisis that we have, um, which I'll go into in a second and your very minimal contribution to social and affordable housing. Um, and I want to ask about your connection to the vulture funds and the impact that that's had on tenants who are living in those properties and on your write downs to developers. So th the first one is what contribution NAMA is playing to social and affordable housing. Now in your presentation you say NAMA will deliver 20,000 homes. Just lest anyone out there be clear, that's 20,000 homes in general, 10% of those will be social housing. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The reason I raise it is I'm a little bit sick of hearing about the starter homes that NAMA is allegedly delivering all over the country where demand is clear, where, de where demand is in greatest, you say, in your presentation. Um, there's great demand in Dublin 15, I can tell you, with massive housing crisis. But yet, there's two NAMA estates building on very rare land that's left in the area. Um, Hamilton Park in Dismaldstown Dismald Manor has NAMA involvement. 
The minimal price of those three bed units is 410,000 and 395,000. That's what I checked two days ago. If it's changed, you can let me know. How are they starter homes? And how are they ever going to get into the hands of the people that need them? They're not. Um, just also in relation to your delivery of social housing, you, you say the totality of vacant housing stock NAMA inherited was passed over for social housing. But Mr Daly says it was 14,000 empty houses. It, we inherited 14,000 at the beginning of NAMA. Yeah. yeah. You inherited, but how many were offered to the local authorities? Because it seems six, in this... Six, six, six and a half thousand. What happened to the other... The rest of the tenanted people in them. You, you off, you, did you offer 14,000 no, for social six housing? No, we offered OK, so why did you say that you offered no, 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 the vacant, no, vacant no, housing no. stock within your original... We offer, we offer yes, vacant, well, you can come vacant. back in after on it, OK? Yeah. Yeah. But the key word is vacant housing stock. There's no point in offering... Houses to local authorities or housing bodies if they're already occupied. You said we inherited 14,000 empty homes, and then you yeah. say you offered the totality of vacant housing stock yeah, okay. for social housing. So I'm just wondering where well, the gap is. You Mr. Daly, you can reply to them separately. Okay. We, we so take the questions. Now you're building on 40, 